Hi, Pastor Matt Morton here, lead pastor at Cross Fellowship Church. Uh, before the message begins, I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, it is our hope and our prayer that by watching this video we uh, and hearing the message that indeed it can help you take one step closer to Jesus today. At the end of the sermon today, you'll hear me offer an invitation to the audience. And the invitation is simply to put your trust and your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're listening today or watching online and you have never done that, uh, can I just encourage you to take that step, take the step to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now maybe you have some questions or you just need to know more about that or even how to do that. At the bottom of the screen, here is a telephone number. That's the church office. Uh, please give that number a call. And if it's during office hours, the, the staff will direct you towards a pastor to help walk you through uh, how do you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. And if it's out of office hours, please leave a message and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching today and blessings. Well, being the young adult pastor for as long as I was, I, I really had a great opportunity to watch uh, young single people fall in love, get into a relationship, and then, then ultimately uh, get married. And uh, at this point, um, I think I've, I've got to be the officiant for uh, upwards of 75 or so weddings. Um, and uh, it's been, it really is a, a privilege. Now, I tell you that not to, to brag, but rather to let you know in, in all of those uh, weddings, I have this ethic that we will do premarital counseling um, before we move into this covenant of marriage because um, marriage can be difficult. Marriage can be hard. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't hear anyone say amen, right? That's good. That's a, especially if you're sitting next to your spouse. Uh, see, see, my approach to premarital counseling, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, I, I don't have to get the couples excited about being married. They're really excited about going into marriage. And, and so really my approach uh, about, uh, you know, working through premarital counseling is simply this. I, I want to give the couple some realistic expectations about marriage, right? Because when our expectations go unmet, that is the very definition of disappointment, unmet expectations. And so what I work really hard on is, is trying to bring up uh, uh, things that they can expect, difficulties that they can expect in marriage, because quite frankly, they don't know what they don't know. And so we can talk about, hey, you may encounter this, you may encounter that, and this is the work that you will need to put in to overcome maybe some of those uh, difficulties or those things that you weren't expecting. Well, this morning, we're looking at three parables, and we will look at each one individually, but generally speaking, we can look at these three parables with a lens in which Jesus is offering to his listeners that, that there's what we can expect being part of the kingdom of heaven in this age that we live in right now called the church age. Right? That there are, there are going to be things that may be difficult in this time as being a part of the kingdom of heaven that we will need to work on, be warned of, pay attention to in this church age. And so um, I want to, you know, as I've said church age here a couple times, I don't want to get into too much eschatology here, but I do want to depict for you what I mean by church age. Um, so I've drawn a picture of, of biblical history, because that's what I do, I draw pictures. Um, and so let's just start uh, from the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start. Um, you guys can all start singing if you want to. So let's start with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then shortly thereafter, we have the fall. Man rebels and disobeys. And that ushers in a time called the Old Testament times. These are the days in which God did not wash his hands of mankind, but rather established a covenant with man, explaining how he would be faithful to them, but they needed to engage in, in following his law, and then also a series of ceremonies and festivals and, and sacrifices to uh, relate to him. But, but all of that was really a meantime waiting for the Son of Man, the Messiah, God's Son, Jesus, to come to earth. And so what ended the old Testament times is the first coming of Christ. 
And Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, walked this earth, lived a sinless life, and then died on the cross for your sins, for my sins, and rose again on the third day that we may be forgiven our sins, and by his blood ushered in what we call the church age, the church age. This is where you and I currently exist. Now, the rest of this timeline, right, I may get emails about, and that's okay, right, because I am depicting a, I'm a pre-tribulational rapturist guy, right? I'm a pre-tribber. Um, and, and so to that end, that's what I'm depicting. If you're not a pre-tribulational rapturist, that's okay. No problem. Um, we can sit down and talk about it, but please pack a lunch because I will, because it's going to take us a long time because people have been talking about this for centuries. So all that to say, what ends the church age, what moves us on to the next uh, a step here, I guess, period, is, is the rapture where Jesus calls for uh, his saints. And then we enter uh, what's called the tribulational period. Uh, during this period, there will be death and destruction. And really, this, this period of time is the last movement by God uh, to have people turn towards him. There's all these supernatural events that take place that hopefully get people's attention to turn towards God. And the tribulation ends with the second coming of Christ, where he, begin, where he comes and he sets up his rule and reign. It's called the millennial reign, and it's for a thousand years years. Now, now, when he comes back, there's Armageddon, and there's, there's a punishment for, demon, for, uh, for the devil and his demons, and they, they get thrown into the lake of fire for a period of time, and then uh, that's for a thousand years, and then we have the great white throne judgment, where there's the final judgment, and then, and then we all enter into eternity. Okay, so I just put a lot out there, but I, what I really want us to kind of hone in on here is that this morning, we're going to look at three parables that directly relate to the church age, but do hint at the end of the church age and moving forward. And I just really want to draw that out so we're not, we're not, you know, interpreting this or looking at this that, you know, this is a final great white throne judgment end of age. No, we're talking about the end of the church age. So with that eschatology in mind, let's dig in. Verse 24. Put, Another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now, um, again, a parable is a common everyday story with a spiritual meaning. And what we have in this story, just like what we had last week, this is a story about agriculture and farming. And I will tell you, in the last several weeks, to include this week, I've learned a lot about agriculture, right, in in trying to understand the context. Because um, this is a story that Jesus' listeners could relate to, even even the piece of an enemy uh, being vengeful and sowing uh, weeds into uh, into a field, right? And we know that this took place, and it took place quite often because there was a Roman law that actually made it a crime to go sow weeds in someone else's field. So this was happening, and Jesus' listeners would have been able to relate to this story. Now, the weeds that were sown, it's really fascinating. These weeds would grow alongside the wheat. Sometimes they're called weeds. Sometimes they're called tares. If you hear me go, wheat and tares, same thing. Um, sometimes they're called tares, weeds, but these, these tares would grow up alongside the wheat. They would look like the wheat. They would go through the seasons uh, with the wheat, but it wasn't until uh, it was time for harvest that you could tell the difference. And so that explains verse 26. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. Now, this weed that I'm talking about, I told you I learned a lot about agriculture. It's called darnel darnel grass. And this is um, the definition of it. In fact, some regions, um, it's called false wheat. But you can see there, look how similar that looks. And and what takes place with this weed is is as it grows alongside the wheat, the the root system of this weed actually intertwines with the root system of the wheat. And and so you can't just go weed it out. You'll pull up the wheat as well. Now, I wanted to start there with a little bit of context. I'm not going to explain the parable because Jesus does. So let's jump down to verse 36, shall we? Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, 
The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. So Jesus really interprets us, interprets this parable for us. So let's look at, at what he just articulated in terms of what represents what. First off, the sower equals Jesus, right? The good sower. The good seed, uh, in this case, equals the followers of Christ. Now, if we go back to last week's parable, right, there's good seed, which is the gospel, and it takes root in the good soil. Well, in this case, the good seed are the followers of Christ. Now, the enemy sower, this is the devil. And the weeds are those who oppose Christ. Now, this might be a hard word. But, but let's recall Matthew 12, 30. Jesus is clearly articulating there is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. In Matthew 12, 30, he says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Ultimately, those who do not follow Christ, by default, have an allegiance to Satan. And I, I got it. That's a hard word. But we have multiple pieces of scriptural evidence that backs that point. We can, we can stay in the book of Matthew and go to chapter 4, where Jesus is being tempted. And in the final temptation, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it says, the devil took him, him being Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus did not argue the authority of Satan to give those kingdoms to him. In fact, Jesus even multiple times in his ministry calls Satan the prince of the power of the air or the, the ruler of this world. Satan, up to this point, had a certain amount of authority in the world up until Jesus rose again. Right before Jesus ascends, right before the, the Great Commission, he says something that's really important to, to us all. In Matthew 28, 18, it says that Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. See, when Jesus died and rose again, he took back all of the authority of the earth. He took back the keys to the death, hell, and the grave. And so Jesus has authority over all of the world. And that plays into the meaning behind this parable here. And so we'll look at a couple other representations and then we'll close that thought. The harvest is the end of the church age. We spoke about that. And then the reapers, these are uh, the angels that are sent out by Jesus to gather up all that that causes sin and the lawbreakers. Now, lawbreakers, this means those who have not been justified. That's the big Christianese term to mean those who have been declared, uh, that have not been declared, okay. Justified means those who have been declared righteous or not guilty, right? It's a legal term. That, that we are declared not guilty by the blood of Christ. And so lawbreakers, these are ones who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. That's what it refers to here. And then this is a really key, important point for us on this parable that moves us to uh, the final meaning here. The field equals the world. Jesus says the field is the world. And so that goes back to his authority. But it matters that the field is the world because there's some interpretations out there of this particular parable that, that really that the field means the church and that, and that there's wheat and tares in the church and, and, and we should go around sin sniffing. I'm not sure that's exactly what Jesus was saying here. And rather, I think the, the, the point, the teaching point right here is simply this, that we should expect that the church will exist in a world with evil until the end of the church age. Right? We should expect that the church will exist in a world with evil until the end of the church age. Now, this may seem rudimentary, but again, put yourself in the sandals of these first listeners. This new, this, this Messiah is on, uh, on the stage. We've been waiting for him. We've been, we've been expecting him. And he, is he going to overthrow the government? Is he going to purge all evil? What's going to take place? What's going to take place in this kingdom of heaven? How is this going to look? And Jesus is offering expectations here. Until I come back, you just need to know 
that evil will exist in the world that the church does until I come back to make everything new and right, and that I vindicate it all, which really brings us to the next couple of verses here. So verse 28 is a part of the parable. He said to them, an enemy has done this in regards to planting the weeds. So the servant said uh, to him, do you, uh, then do you want us to go and gather, th- gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the weed along with them. Let both grow together until, until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. So again, uh, the wheat and the tares are growing together. They're going through seasons together. And at the end, when the plants have matured and one is bearing fruit and one is not, then it is clear which is the wheat and which are the weeds. And we're the same way if you think about it. We live in a world as Christ followers that we we grow up alongside those who reject Christ. We uh, go through seasons alongside those who oppose Christ, who don't follow Christ. We, We are friends with them. We work alongside them. In fact, we live in a world where we watch people uh, do evil things and seemingly get away with it. But let us remember, when time has matured, there will be a reckoning. I want to be very careful here in that we don't, and I already mentioned it, not every detail in a parable has a spiritual meaning. And there are some who've, who've said, well, by the fact that the weeds won't be pulled up to, to harm the wheat, that, that God will not allow harm to come to Christians. We've got to talk to Stephen about that, don't we? We've got to talk to, to Paul about that, don't we? If the church is going to exist in a world where there's also evil, there's going to be harm. In God's permissive will, harm does come to Christians. There's a martyr's crown. And there's great reward. And again, at the end, all will be vindicated. If we jump down to 39 to interpret this portion of the parable, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is describing a place called hell. And I don't know why it has become unpopular to preach on the very real place called hell, but it has. Now, here's the thing. If I love you and I do, what kind of pastor would I be if I didn't tell you that hell is real and I don't want you to go there? Hell is an eternity spent away from God. And just like I don't want you to go there, God doesn't want you to go there. The Bible tells me so. In 2 Peter 3, 7 through 9, by the same word, again, speaking of the the end of the age, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. But the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness but patient toward you. And then this is so key. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God desires to spend eternity with those that he has created. That's his desire. That's what the Bible tells me. And in his love, as he has created us, he has created us with free will. I don't want to get into too deep of conversations here, but Know that the Bible teaches that he has chosen you and that we choose. Right? That's what the Bible teaches. And the best quick analogy I can give you is if you took a, a, a rope and you threw it up over a monkey bar and you grabbed up both ends of those ropes and you pulled yourself up off the ground, you have to hold on to both ends of those rope, uh, of that rope, otherwise you'll fall. Right? If you want to stay off the ground, you have to hold on to both ends of that rope. You let go of one, you'll fall. You let go of the other, you'll fall. It's the same way. You've been chosen, yet you choose, but that's not the point. The point is simply this. It is God's desire to spend eternity with you. That's awesome. He's patient, not wishing any should perish. All right, let's look at 
the next parable. It's only a few verses here. Verse 31, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed that man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, unlike the other two parables that we've studied so far, we don't have an explanation from Jesus on this one. And so I will tell you, there's been some scrutiny uh, and some real contention about how to interpret this particular uh, parable. One of the things that uh, is often scrutinized is about the size of a mustard seed. That Jesus says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And point in fact, it, it actually is not the smallest of all seeds. The lady slipper orchid seed Told you I learned a lot about agriculture. The lady slipper orchid seed is about 20 times smaller than the mustard seed. It measures um, 0.1 by 0.03 millimeters, right? And it takes often a microscope to see. Well, guess what? In Jesus' time, in his listeners, they didn't have microscopes. So what is Jesus saying when he says it's the smallest of all seeds? Well, the mustard seed was the smallest known seed at that time. And the point should be taken that Jesus is articulate, whether it's having faith the size of a mustard seed or in, in this parable, that it's something very, very, very small. Okay? That, that, that's the point there. And in fact, mustard seeds, uh, for their size, they end up going into a plant uh, or a bush that's between 8 and 10 feet high. That actually plays into this a little bit. Now, as I just said, there's some disagreement on how to interpret this. There's some disagreement about this particular parable's meaning. Uh, uh, One interpretation is that this parable, Jesus is explaining that the kingdom of heaven will start small, and then it will grow uh, really large for all to find refuge. And that even uh, Jesus is, is alluding here to a verse found in Ezekiel 17, in which God is speaking to the nation of Israel about replanting them as a nation, And he says that he will make them a noble cedar tree, which cedar trees grow between about 60 and 120 feet. I told you a lot about agriculture. Um, And that there will be branches and the birds will come and perch in them. Now, in premise, I don't disagree, right? Right? The gospel, I mean, mean, the church started with 12, 11 at first, 11 guys, and and then it has grown. So in premise, I don't disagree with, with that statement. But I do disagree that this particular parable is saying that. And the reason that I disagree is because of a hermeneutic I ascribe to called expositional constancy, which is a really fancy way of saying that we let Scripture interpret. I love you guys. We let Scripture interpret Scripture. And what expositional constancy means and says that if you have something that symbolizes something else throughout Scripture, then that's the way that you allow it to symbolize throughout Scripture. So in our case here, birds, throughout Scripture, except in one or two cases, throughout Scripture, birds are always a picture of evil. In fact, look at the parable we just studied. In that parable, Verse 3, there is some seed that's thrown along the path and and it says that the birds came and devoured it. And then when Jesus is explaining that parable in verse 19, what does he say? That the birds are are, are the evil one. He calls birds, they're representing Satan. Throughout scripture, we see birds representing evil. And so I don't believe that this parable is about describing the healthy growth of a church. Another reason that I don't think this parable is explaining the healthy growth of a church but something different is the, the words Jesus, Jesus uses in describing this plant. He says it's the, one of the mustard seeds, one of the smallest seeds, and then when it grows into a plant, it's one of the largest plants, or it is the largest plants in the garden, but then what, what does he say? He says, but when it becomes a tree, mustard seeds don't grow into trees. Jesus is articulating when this seed becomes something that it's not designed to be, evil will come and perch in its branches. And I absolutely believe that's how uh, we should interpret this parable. 
that during the church age, we should be warned. We should be warned that the church will experience corruption. Just like I try to set expectations for for pre-marrieds. Hey, you need to be warned of this. You need to be on the lookout for this kind of behavior. I think Jesus is warning us that in this church age, the church will experience corruption, and we must have wisdom and discernment against such corruption. Let me just give you an example, if I may. Uh, I appreciated how Steve called me youngish. Thanks, brother. In my youngish life, uh, uh, of church life, I've seen a liberal and corrupt church abandon the word of God. I have seen a liberal and corrupt church church substitute biblical justice for a societal defined woke agenda type of justice. I have seen a a liberal and corrupt church celebrate and embrace aberrant lifestyles that are not God's best. I have seen a liberal and corrupt church turn a blind eye to millions of lives that are lost from abortion under the falsehood that an unborn child is merely a piece of tissue or a choice. I've seen a liberal and corrupt church exchange the very truth of God for lies that are described as relative truth. It is the liberal and corrupt truth that is nothing more than an overgrown plant with evil perched in it. And family, church, we must not be a church that allows evil to perch in the branches of Cross Fellowship. We must have wisdom and discernment against such ideologies. Let's look at this last parable, verse 33. And he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. A little bit about leaven, contextually speaking. Leaven, uh, first, it was actually forbidden to be used in grain offerings to the Lord. So if you go to the temple and you're going to give a grain offering, you'd have to go with unleavened bread. And in fact, during certain festivals, In Jewish life, leaven had to be removed from the house altogether. The way leaven works is it causes the bread to rise through fermentation. That that ultimately, bread rises because bacteria and other things, whatever that leavening agent is, it's the putrefaction of it, and it releases gases, and it causes the bread to rise. I know you all are hungry for lunch now. And it's unallowed in offerings because leaven often represents death and decay. And so just like the mustard seed parable, there is some disagreement in how this particular parable is interpreted. One view is that uh, this parable is really uh, that the leaven is a symbol of the kingdom of heaven and how it's how it's going to Uh, gradually and secretly permeate the society. Again, the woman hid the leaven. Quite frankly, I take exception with that. Jesus is super clear in the same way. Let your light shine before men so they see your good deeds and give praise to your Father who is in heaven. Tell me anywhere in the Bible where it says, be secret about the gospel. It doesn't. So I, I don't agree with that interpretation. In fact, going back to the idea of expositional constancy, what we see is that leaven is is constantly used in the Bible as a picture of corruption and decay and evil. In fact, in Matthew 16, 11, Jesus tells his disciples, he warns his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of that leaven because what it does, leaven expands, it infects the entirety of the loaf. Leaven grows and it makes a mess. Let me just show you this picture right here. This actually came from um, the countertop of our own uh, uh, Greg Hudson, right, Greg? You, you, you saw this. This was your picture, right? Yeah, fine photography, my friend. Um, he, texts, 
he texts this picture to his wife, who was, she was uh, just uh, out for a time and uh, a couple of days, and, and this was a friendship bread, and, you know, you're supposed to have yeast in it, you're supposed to burp it and all these things, and when you don't, it kind of explodes, right? Because that's what leaven does. It just makes a mess, and so your friendship bread um, can really turn into demon dough, just quite frankly. I had to say it. It makes a mess. It expands. It gets everywhere. Right? When it's, it, it gets out of control. And multiple times throughout the Bible, the New Testament, uh, Paul speaks about how a little leaven uh, leavens the whole lump. Verse 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, for as you are unleavened, for Christ is our Passover lamb. Which, by the way, during that Passover feast, you had to have unleavened bread. Has been sacrificed. Verse 8, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so using expositional constancy, I believe that this parable of leaven is simply this, that sin that is allowed to multiply in the church will decay and corrupt her purity. And an an unpure church is a powerless church. So what do we do about it? Well, first... And foremost, 1 John 1, 9, and 10, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We confess our sins to the Father to be cleansed and to be forgiven of our sins. But if you turn to James, James who wrote a letter to the church, the church in dysphoria, and you go to James 5, 16, you see James gives a very clear instruction to the church. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed for the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. So if you want to be forgiven of your sins, you confess to God. If you want to be healed of your sins, right? If you want to be forgiven, you confess to God. If you want to be healed, you confess to one another. And so here's my question for you. Do you have anyone, right? I'm not speaking of like getting into a box and, you know, saying something to someone you don't know, but do you have a person or, or, or people in your life that, that you can say, hey, I am struggling with something right now. Every Tuesday afternoon, you can find me with four guys in which we, we, we lay it out. This is what we're struggling with. And we do that for two reasons. One, since power is in its secret, so we're gonna get that thing out into the light. But then secondly, they can pray for me. I can pray for them and, and we can hold each other accountable. Because an unpure church is a powerless church, and let us never be powerless. So today we looked at what we can expect in this church age, that we should remember that, that while the church, uh, in this church age, it's going to coexist with evil until one day when Jesus comes back to make it all right. But until then, let us be warned, and let us be wise, and let us be discerning against corruption in the church, and let us enter this beautiful ethic of, conf- uh, 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 of confession, repentance, reconciliation. That we may not allow sin to multiply, but they, that we may be a church power. So let us be faithful in, in those ethics. Will you bow your heads with me? wanted to simply close again with, with, with just two responses here. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've just heard me say a, 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 lot, of, a lot of hard things that maybe even feel offensive. But let me start simply this, with this. God wants to spend eternity with you. God wants to spend eternity with you. And so if you've never put your faith in Jesus, that you can have an eternity with him compared to having an eternity without him in a place called hell. If you've never done that, in a moment we're going to stand and sing, but you you know that, hey, I'm not going to stand and sing. There's something I need to take care of. I want to put my faith in Jesus. It's going to look just like this. I'm going to ask for you uh, just to not stand and sing, but to sit and pray and pray a very simple prayer. We call it the ABC prayer, that you admit that you're a sinner, that B, you believe that Jesus came, lived the perfect life, 
died on the cross for those sins and rose again. Admit, believe, and then in this prayer, confess with your whole heart and mean it that you want Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. Admit, believe, confess. That's how we, that's how we move into the kingdom. The way we get in is the way that we go on. Maybe you've put your faith in Jesus, but you got a little leaven in your lump. Maybe you get some birds perching in parts of your life that you know shouldn't be there. Maybe when we stand and sing, you need to just spend some, some time to sit and pray and get right with God. In either case, I'll be up here at the front. Miss Jen will be up here at the front. If you have questions about becoming a believer, how do you... You get how do you put your faith in Jesus, or or you just need prayer, or, or there's things going on in your life right now that, that that are just incredibly hard, and you just need prayer. We will be up here. We're here for you. We want to walk this road with you, celebrate with you, cry with you, whatever it is. But in either case, if God is telling you to do something, if you're feeling that urge, that unction, if you will, then then move. Because this isn't too theologically deep, but let me just tell you, if you do nothing, nothing changes. So if God's telling you to move, then move. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. God, I pray uh, in this moment that you just move and that you move mightily. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Family, let's stand, let's sing, let's worship. Let's worship.